Thank you for listening to The Lawyer's Daughter. This is Jen Carroll, and this podcast does not have any video. I know I'm on YouTube, but that doesn't matter. I really appreciate you listening to the podcast here. Let's go get started. Hello, my friends. It is August 22nd, Thursday. It is the last day of the Democratic National Convention. And I don't know if you guys watched last night. I hope you did. Man, this is one hell of a convention. I I am blown away. And I'll tell you what, the minute Gus came out, Gus Walls came out and, and he just was crying with joy and pride and love and all the things that normal people do. And so was um, the daughter Hope. So it was Tim's daughter Hope. She's bawling. And then I realized I had this moment. My family, my mom's family, the one that probably taught me the most socially, my mom's family is from Minnesota and they cry like I cry, which is, I just let it go. I'm a crier. I don't know what to say. Sorry, Lisa. I've always been a crier and I, I, it just gets rid of so much for me to just let it go. So to watch the kids cry bravely, like just totally smiling and happy and joy through the tears. I so identified that and I realized I'm having way too much personal identification also with just this whole genre of humans that are clearly Gen X. And and I, I want to say this to anybody Gen Z who might happen to listen to this. And I know that's going to be rare because who's going to listen to an old lady? But and I'm not that old, people. I'm just saying I'm not that old. I'm still vicious. I will fight. I'm here for a fight. But what I'm saying is, um, you know, society decides we're irrelevant after 60. So here I am becoming relevant. And what I will tell you is that Gen Z, you guys are in parallel with Gen X. I can just feel it. You get it. You're over it. You have dealt with crap. The same thing happened to you guys that happened with us in terms of the boomers taking up all the space. And us being the scrappy dudes behind, cleaning things up and getting what we need to do because it's harder when you come behind a big cohort. And Gen Z had the same issue. And the reason I know this is because my daughter's Gen Z and she is really good at reading the culture. I'm Not all the culture, but the culture she's good at reading. How's that for a qualifier? Anyway, she always is um, crushing my assumptions by pointing out how much things have changed. And yet... Culturally, I think Gen Z and Gen X have a lot in common. So I'm just saying that I am so over identifying and it feels so good. It feels good to see smart women everywhere. These are the women. I, I became Jewish because, well, my daughter is Jewish, but that's a long story. But um, I became Jewish because of the women in the Jewish temple. These were the smartest women I'd ever met. And they were empowered to not be housewives. I don't know how to explain to you the significance of this, but they led temple school and they taught us and I learned from them and I learned so much from them. It was, it came at a critical time in my life, especially because my father had basically kicked me out and these women were amazing. And that's what I feel with this convention. The men are the kind of men I'm used to too, which are normal, regular guys, like guys. They're not men, they're guys. And I say you guys all the time because guys mean something to me. Guys mean men who are super comfortable around women. Guys meet are men who think women rock and would never think of planning something without including women because why would you not have women come make it better, different, fun, whatever. I, I just love seeing all the guys that are regular guys. And then, of course, the diversity. So I'm not going to keep going on and on and on, but the diversity is so good too because... You just don't see it in our in our government, except on the Democratic side. You don't see it in the in enough with the pundits on television, except when they're like forced to be the representative of their culture, which is just weird. Although, give me some jo- joy on any time and, and all of that. But I'm saying I just love this diversity that everybody is invited to the party. And it, it's how I felt at Pride, where I was just like, here's a 62 year old woman who's short and fat. And like, I just belonged. They didn't care who I slept with. They just cared about me. It was just so nice. And that's what I feel about this Democratic convention. So here we go. Is we go so I'm going to talk about the, 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 I just needed to do a little bit of gushing because it's just been so fun. And I realize I'm exhausted. I am ex- And I'm on the West Coast. So let's be clear. I get to watch a show before I go to bed. 
uh, and I'm still exhausted. So that's, that's, that's how you can tell a real Gen Xer when they get to watch a show. That was our, that was always our thing. Just one more show. Mom, can I watch a show? Can we please just watch the show? Be quiet. I'm watching my show. That, that's all true Gen X. Just taking everybody back for that one. So, okay. What is the point of an acceptance speech? That's the big deal tonight is the acceptance speech. Why are they important? Why are we, why are we here in this part of the process and how does it contribute to our democracy? So, so, all right, I'm going to do a little convention analysis. I decided I can't do it real time. It's just exhausting me. It's too much to keep up with. So I'm going to do some of that over the weekend and come back and look at some of the themes and how the speeches went and all of that and help us know how to use this content in the speeches to help us go influence others. I think that would be helpful as we need to move forward. But right now, for you to understand and for me to understand what the role is in our democratic process, in our de in our democracy, the role of a, of a convention acceptance speech there is a defined role. And I, and I would just want to shout out to the DNC for turning conventions upside down. From the roll call to Barack Obama questioning why crowd size is so crucial to Lil John busting his way down to the floor. And I mean, like I said, lunatic in the house all by herself. Party one, close the doors and windows because Jen's in there like acting like a fool. Yeah, that was me. But we also have heard some of the most gut-wrenching, heart-rending stories from people's, based on people's lives and including the one from the folks who have hostages in Gaza or wherever. We don't even, I don't even know where the hostages are. I just know that they seem to share this middle ground where their situation sucks and they don't believe killing everybody else in, in Gaza is the answer, which is honest to God, the problem here. And, and until we can get other people out of these talks and just let our president, who's very good at this, Biden is really good at this. If we could just let Biden negotiate with Netanyahu without any other former presidents or candidates being involved, we might have a chance. But I'm not going to take that on right now either. So let's, what is this, what is the point of tonight's speech? The democracy purpose, the reasons the democracy drives for this kind of event is it presents the candidates vision. Well, actually, sorry, I'm just going to interrupt because Bill Clinton said it so well last night. But let me just say the formal reason and then I'll tell you what Bill said last night because it's stuck. One is to present the candidates vision for the country. Hella important. What is it you want to do? And, and I prepared a little bit in this to tell you about how these visions manifest because we so are... Americans are always so focused on the moment, right? And like the moment in the three minutes ahead of us, like, and then regrets, but we're not going to talk about regrets, but Americans are just weird like that. We perseverate on all the weirdest things. Okay. So in this though, it's, it's really important that we present the candidate's vision and then I can show you how the vision's played out. Articulate the party's core values and principles. So what is it that makes this party so special? And then to rally the electorate. Hey, that's us and uh, around a shared purpose. So it's doing everything it's supposed to be doing, but it actually serves a democratic purpose. So I wanted to pull that out. And this is the chance for them to speak directly to the American people. And you know, it'll be clipped and soundbited to death going forward. So we'll see clips from this. It's kind of nice to watch it the first time in context. So you understand why the clips resonated. Okay. Now it, there's also obviously a political purpose to the speech. So you might think, well, are the democracy purposes the same as the political? And the political, the answer is no. The political purpose is very tied to your campaign strategy. So what is it that you want to do? It, it sets the pace, um, the tone for the general election campaign, but it really is the strategy of how you're going to do it. Like, are we going to, we're going to, uh, let me give some examples. Like, we're going to use all, we're going to use testimonials They're Now they're going to use a mix of all these things because no campaign would ever stick with one thing, but we're going to use testimonials. It's interesting because you look at the other campaign, you don't see a lot of testimonials. You see a lot of kind of made up endorsements, but you really don't see testimonials. I'm going to contend is because the policies they have don't make people want to stand up and have a testimonial. Uh, and they're, and they have had a few that are the unusual examples of something that absolutely fits their narrative. But generally, uh, that would be an approach. That could be part of your campaign strategy. Your campaign strategy want, could be that I want to get every voter to do one good deed 
for the campaign. That could be your strategy. I, I'm just making these up. So when you think about it, the speech also has a political purpose. And, and let's listen for that tonight. An acceptance speech should absolutely unify the party, present a clear vision, and differentiate from the opponent... So think about that. It's got to be also differentiate. And we've seen a lot of differentiation this week. They do this. We do that. We want, we believe in this. They believe in that. That Project 25 thing last night was brilliant. I felt really bad for the first guy who couldn't get his audio to work. Again, over-identifying with the convention. But um, I'm like, oh, they didn't come back to him either. He missed his shot. Ah, maybe they'll put it on social media so we can see it. Poor guy. And then, of course, they're supposed to inspire and motivate. So not just differentiating, but inspiring and motivating. So let me go back for a quick minute because I was going to drop that Bill Clinton thing. I thought Bill Clinton's speech last night, first of all, I was surprised to see him quite as shaky as he was and his voice not as strong as I'm used to. But for those of us Gen Xers who grew up back in the day, as they say, he was a hero for us. He got us out of the Reagan years. He came with this... Um, liberal agenda, which is inclusive. We now know liberal doesn't mean bad. It means inclusive and diverse and positive and dare I say normal. Um, but he came with that agenda in, in the 90s. So a lot of us last night were just vibing. But it was it was distressing to see his handshakes. But in the middle of his speech, and he it's said that he ended up rewriting it this week because he started to read the room and realized he was coming in probably to Bill and uh, to Clinton. No, it would be to Bill and not enough Clinton because Clinton's the one that plays that jazz, that jazz sax. Probably not anymore. But it, it was interesting to see him. But I love the part when he said, look, basically the presidency is the greatest job anybody can apply for. This is the application process and you are the hire. You are the people who do the hiring. So huh, the job description is basically there, but you get to hire me and and the job only lasts four years and you get to rewrite the job description every four years as well. And that's, there's no better example of how much the presidency can't be the same job every four years. It just cannot be by the very nature of our democracy and who we are as Americans. Things change, priorities change, circumstances change. And so, yeah, we do need to write the job description every four years. And I think We've written the job description for for the 2024 election. The job description for our next president is to go continue to maintain our relationships with our allies, is to bring joy to this nation again, and to find ways to work together to lift everyone up. That's the job description. There's all the regular stuff. But if you look at the context of the job description that we need for right now, how we solve the problems might actually change. And so that's why we're interviewing our candidate. And that's why this, I think looking for the ability to adapt, flex, bend, that's a, that surprisingly, as much as we hear about Joe being stubborn, the reality is, is him getting stuff done has has been his ability to, to negotiate, to compromise. So there you go. Okay. Oh, blah, blah, blah. I get excited about this stuff. Sorry. So this is what the speech is supposed to do. Let me give you just, uh, just so, so you have a little bit of a historical example. Let me give you some examples of some acceptance speeches that worked well. And then when I say that worked, that's me writing the words that worked. That's shorthand for they were impressive. They got a lot of attention. They were a big deal. So I just made it faster by saying they worked. In 2008, it was Barack Obama versus John McCain. And in his convention acceptance speech, Obama delivered a message of hope and change. Remember hope. Um, What was it? Hope reconsidered, hope revisited, hope is back. There was something. Michelle Obama said it. You know, all of you smarty pants right now are telling me me through my uh, podcast what it is. He delivered the message of hope and change. And his campaign slogans were like, yes, we can change we can believe in and hope. They were rallying rallying cries for the supporters. And when he declared tonight, I say to the American people, to Democrats and Republicans and independents across the great land, enough. He was again coming from a time of great division. It was uh, baby Bush, George, George the second Bush that had been in office since um, the beginning before he ran in 2000. It was 
George W. Bush and we had had 9-11 and then we had the housing crisis. So Barack walked into a hot mess. But here's the deal. Here's what he was able to do. He served for eight years. And remember I talked about like they have a vision. Well, here's a few things from his bucket list. The Affordable Care Act as he joked last night that uh, the other night that probably nobody refers to as Obamacare anymore, but I do because that thing saved my life. The same year he did the Dodd-Frank Wall Street reform. Remember that when we tried to get put everybody back in their swim lane because consumers were not being protected. He also did the 2009 America and Recovery and Reinvestment Act, which is a stimulus package that was invested in infrastructure, education, health, and renewable energy. It also provided some tax relief and, and created jobs. A really important, I don't know if everybody gets this, but when somebody builds legislation and they say all this, the, whatever we're doing is going to serve someone else, the part that they don't talk about enough, and that's really important to us, the voters, is that a lot of this legislation creates jobs or economic opportunity for a lot of us, the vast middle class. And I say vast because there's a lot of people who aren't in the middle class, but they're so freaking close. And there's people that are in the middle class who are really close to, I guess, moving out. But the middle class is vast. And we're the ones who pay our bills every month and work and have picnics and drink too much at a party. Well, I'm sorry, that was about me again. You already know I can't drink. So the, the idea that these amazing things can happen and that they reflect the times is really powerful. So, and finally, in 2010, Obama did the Don't Ask, Don't Tell Repeal Act, ending, uh, ending the policy that prevented gay people from saying they were gay and serving in the military. I, okay, I'm, I get it. It took a while to get there, but we got there. That's why we don't want to go back, folks. It's just insane how long it takes to get some things to, to, to be fair or to be accessible. Let's go on to Bill Clinton, who we were just talking about in 1992. He was running against George Herbert Walker Bush, Poppy Bush. Clinton's acceptance speech was a defining moment in the campaign, campaign as it f focused on this economic renewal, renewal and an idea of a new covenant. Now, this language of this new covenant really made sense coming from Bill Clinton because he was from the South and he had a little bit of that Southern Baptist vibe to him. So I don't remember New Covenant, but I was not really old enough to be paying much attention is what I'm seeing based on the year. I think I was really working hard in those years. And he, he Clinton was refusing to let America fail. And again, he believed in a place called hope. Isn't it interesting? Hope resonates for the Democrats over and over. In fact, I don't know that I've ever heard the GOP go after hope. Morning in America was probably about, and we're going to talk about that in a minute, it was probably the closest thing. Clinton's speech established him as the candidate of change, and he came from Hope, Arkansas, which was always a good thing to, to exploit. What a great name of a place. And he was really positioned as a leader who understood the struggles of everyday Americans, which is often a challenge for the, when the white elite come in and want to hold office. They don't even know how to go to the store. So after um, Clinton served eight years, and here's some of the big stuff that he got passed while he served. One was the Family and Medical Leave Act. That allowed, look at guys, this is in 93. He passed the Family and Medical Leave Act. If you thought that was around forever, that's not that, that's in my lifetime. And that's not even in my lifetime like a long time ago. He passed NAFTA, a trade agreement that actually helped trade among Canada United States and Mexico, which is basically reducing a lot of barriers and fostering economic cooperation, which again, usually has economic impacts on us. And I don't know, I didn't go study all of these to find out the long-term effects. So do not hold me accountable in that way. I'm just trying to give you some idea of when a president comes in, they have a vision and they execute on it. And it usually is good for all of us. Another one was his Violent Crime Control and Law Enforcement Act. This one I know had issues because um, it introduced the three strike strikes law, which, ugh, I mean, that's one's been kind of, that kind of doesn't really work so well. It's been revised a number of times. I think it also increased incarceration. So again, that's only me, what I know anecdotally. He did the Welfare Reform Act of 1996, which was uh, reforming the welfare system by imposing work requirements and time limits on benefits. And this was a, a concession to the Republicans at that time, but I believe it was done. I don't know. I should shut up. I'm not going to talk about it anymore. 
go look up the Welfare Reform Act of 1996. I don't think it went too sideways. And then finally, as Democrats are wont to do, the Balanced, Balanced Budget Act of 1997. And we finally got to budget surpluses, surpluses in the 1990s due to this Balanced Budget Act that apparently didn't last that long. May, I don't know. Got to find out. Then we have Ronald Reagan. His acceptance speech was in 1994, and that's his second run. So this wasn't his first year. I cannot find a lot about his first year. It looks like just coming off Jimmy Carter, he didn't have to work that hard is what I'm saying. So it, 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 he got much more inspirational in the morning in America during the second his second run. And he said, we're a too great a nation to limit ourselves to, to small dreams. Now, this is important because that theme has come through at the Democratic Convention for sure. This idea of dreams. And this is, I think, one of the, one of the first Republicans that I can find that really speaks to that higher, our higher um, nature, our better nature. What is that? John Grisham or John uh, Meacham always says our higher nature. It's They're quoting somebody. But this, this is an inst- institute instance where the Republican is actually talking about this idea of hope and uh, we shouldn't be limited to small dreams. His slogans were morning in America. Are you better off than you were four years ago? Oh, yes, we've heard that one come back. That's by the way, that's not a dream. That's a very different statement than uh, go reach your dreams. Are you better off than you were four years ago? It's super interesting that slogan because you it's it's open and it's based on how you interpret it, which is of course the beauty of it. It is such a good question because if you have something that's really bugging you or pissing you off, then for sure you know you were you are not better off than you were four years ago. So it was that's a really powerful question, mostly because you can interpret it any way you want. What did Reagan get done in his eight years? He served eight years as well. He did the 1981 Economic Recovery Tax Act. And that was um, designed to have trickle-down economics. So we're going to leave that one right there. We have the Tax Reform Act of 1986. So five years later, he simplified the tax code, reducing rates for individuals and businesses and eliminating a lot of deductions and credits, which is, it did hurt a little bit. The same year, he had the Immigration Reform and Control Act, providing amnesty to millions of undocumented immigrants while implementing new measures to prevent illegal immigration. Yo, yo, yo. Did you hear what I just read from a Republican? The Immigration Reform and Control Act of 1986 provided amnesty to millions of undocumented immigrants. That is amazing. There was a social, he passed the Social Security Amendments of 1983, which always scare me, but it strengthened Social Security by increasing payroll taxes and gradually raising the retirement age. This is what we're likely to see come again, come around again. And then the Comprehensive Crime Control Act of 1984 reformed the federal criminal justice system in introducing measures to combat drug abuse, enforcing tougher sentences, sentencing guidelines, and establishing the U.S. Sentencing Commission. Sentencing. What? God. I apologize, guys. This is a line sometimes. It's really. Ugh. So that's important, though, because that was that is not a lie. Probably be super down on and uh, com- the way they went after drug. It was drug dealers. If you remember Nancy Reagan and her fear of drugs, just say no. That was what was going on then. But still, there's look at this, all this legislation. A lot gets done when you have a president with a real vision. And I don't mean a 2025 vision that's not even his. I mean, because that's just the nefarian white Christian nationalist, nefarious. Um, when you really have a plan, look what Ron Reagan was able to roll out. And then finally, I'm just going to share this a little bit with John F. Kennedy versus Richard Nixon. This is going to go with way back before most of us were born, 1960. John F. Kennedy introduced the new frontier, but I'll tell you what, that new frontier concept caught fire. It was, he was calling for a new generation of leadership. He emphasized the need for courage, innovation, and collective national effort to overcome domestic and international challenges. He, more than anyone I've seen, except for right now, called on the people to come help build our future. 
and I miss that. I grew up as a tiny tot in the space race and I miss that because it seemed like we had such a purpose and we knew what we were doing. He famously said, we stand today on the edge of a new frontier, the frontier of unknown opportunities and perils, a frontier of unfulfilled hopes and threats. Unfulfilled hopes and threats. This visionary approach plus this youthful energy set the tone for the campaign. And, um, and he was able to, okay, so he was assassinated. He only served 22 months. Now, I'm not, I like barely, I, I'm not even born. Some of this, I'm not even born yet. He's only served 22 months. He was assassinated in November of 1962. Aladdin took, uh, um, took the oath in January of 20, of 61. So he served 20, did I do the math right? Yeah, 22 months, 24 minus two. But he was still able, look at this, look what he was able to get done on his vision. In 1963, shortly after his death, the Equal Pay Act aimed to eliminate wage disparity based on gender and ensuring men and women receive equal pay for equal work was passed. Now, we still need to fix stuff there, but look at that, look what he was able to do. The Trade Expansion Act of 1962 authorized the president to negotiate tariff reductions. Now. We, we should probably do a show on tariffs, but the, here's the deal on tariffs. They call, they, we pay for them. We pay for tariffs. They just burden the cost. So here we go. You actually want to work down on tariffs and improve trade. That's how you do it. He did the Area Redevelopment Act of 1961, and he got money out into the nation to to. Uh, help economically distressed regions, create jobs, and stimulate economic growth. And then he did the Manpower Development and Training Act of 19... Sorry, I'm like, Manpower? That's a temporary agency. They probably don't even exist anymore. The Manpower Development and Training Act of 1962 established po programs to retrain unemployed workers and prepare them for jobs in new and growing industries. <sighs> See, it's just so focused on problem, solution. Problem? Let's figure this out. That's how you work with all your legislators. That's why you have Congress. So you can get all the points of view and you can find out where there's a sucker's uh, pothole you're going to fall into. And, and, the, and Republicans are usually as excited or used to be as excited to see where they could influence and make something happen as Democrats. But eh, here we are. And then finally, this last one is very Kennedy. It's very, very Kennedy and Shriver, and it, it just makes my heart sore, and I didn't realize it. He passed the Mental Retardation Facilities and Community Mental Health Centers Construction Act of 1963. Now, this is eons ago, guys, eons. But this is being seen because we had Reagan will later close mental health institutions, but we had institutions, and that's not, that, that they were not, they're not like what you would want an institution to be. So this was a significant help. A step forward in health care, mental health care reform. There are two speeches that didn't go very well at all. Barry Goldwater in 1964 got up at his convention to his accept his nomination against Lyndon Johnson and his 1964 speech, he had one controversial line that basically checked him forever. The ultimate line. Extremism in the, extremism in the offense of liberty is no vice moderation in the pursuit of justice is no virtue. And basically that characterized him as essentially a mad dog. And then if you have to look at 1964, I wanted to provide context too, but I might as well be writing books for how much I want to include in these things. I need to stop. But this context of 1964, there's a war going on. There's, um, there are students in the streets. There is discord and it's going to get worse. It's just starting in 1964. So for Barry Goldwater to come out like that, it alarmed so many moderates within his party and the general electorate that they, uh, yeah, he didn't make it. He just didn't make it. He was not elected. And then, oh, the guy I wrote a letter to in 1972, I was not old enough to vote, but I wrote George McGovern a letter because he lost against Richard Nixon. And I did not know this fun fact because, of course, I was but a mere child. McGovern's acceptance speech at the 1972 Democratic National Convention was marred disabled, just ruined by its lateness. And this is why everybody's sticking to the clock right now. His speech was delivered at 2.48 
a.m. Nearly three in the morning is when they let this man on. Now, I don't know what was going on. I need to go back and find out what kind of shit show was happening here. But holy crap. Most, uh, long after my, <laughs> I wrote, long after most viewers had gone to bed. Yeah, you think? Do you think? He had this message of come home, America, which is, I only find in hindsight, hilariously funny because no, they're home, they're in bed. And he was, it was the appeal to end the Vietnam War, come home, America. His, still his speech's timing and its lack of coherence led to concerns about his organizational skills and effectiveness, which haunted his campaign. On the other hand, we know Richard Nixon was hella organized, um, but I didn't know this happened. And can you imagine your party letting you down so significantly that you don't get on the stage until 10 minutes of eight? I mean, 10 minutes of three and in, in the midnight hours? Like, no, what are you doing? <sighs> that was probably a, a I, I hate it. I don't want Richard Nixon. But the thing is, if the party couldn't pull off, which is the other thing you're seeing right now, you're seeing a party in the Democratic Party right now who has their shit together. They're making their their. 90% on time. They are pulling off surprises. They are pulling off technological feats of ama um, amazement, like having Kamala be in Milwaukee and then drop in on the convention and there was no glitch. Still feel bad for the F Project 2025 guy who couldn't get his audio to work yesterday. But you know, that's when your party makes you look good, it also makes the party, I mean, the party's doing its job. That's what they're supposed to do, make you look good. So, Sorry, George, I had no idea I might have sent you a, more of a sympathy letter than I did in 1972. So tonight's the speech. I was, there's a great graphic going around. Sorry, one more anecdote before I finish. There's a great graphic go around. It's of Kamala and she's in, ah, Gen Z, you'll love this. She is in flower child clothes. And the thing is, we kind of missed flower child because we were younger. So the idea of flower child making a comeback gets me super excited. And so I went and got, um, I'm like, what's that line from the 60s? And the 60s line, I think it was Ken Kesey, turn on, tune in, drop out. But for us, we're going to modify it because I, I just going to sprinkle a little Michelle Obama on this. Tune in, turn on, and do something. That's what we need to do here. Tune in, turn on, and do something. Tonight's the speech from Kamala. Listen to the parts of the speech. Listen if she reassures you what her vision is. Listen to see if she tells you what the mission of the campaign and the administration is going to be. We've been hearing it all week, but it's her job now to deliver the goods tonight. I can't wait. Talk to you tomorrow. Thank you for listening to today's podcast. Make sure you subscribe and rate, and I'll be back with another episode really soon.